Okay. Thanks, everybody, for joining today's panel on Industry 4.0 Innovations, hosted by Ithom Venture Partners and Paul Arena. This is Pankaj Gupta from Ithom Venture Partners. Just to give you a brief overview on Ithom Venture Partners, we are a deep tech accelerator based in Singapore. We have 70 startups in our portfolio. All of these are AI, ML, blockchain, IoT, robotics, AI, we are kind of startups from different parts of the world, stages, and sectors. Power Arena is one of the portfolio startups which is doing fantastic work in the advanced manufacturing industry for the whole space and selling to some really strong Fortune 500 manufacturing companies. Today's panel uh, is going to be focused on industry 4.0 innovations, micro trends, and challenges. And to address the questions and offer insights, we have very, in, uh, we have very intelligent, diverse, and global panel from, uh, from, from obviously uh, different kind of expertise and different kind of industries um, today. Now I will pass, out, pass it on to Ken, who is the founder and CEO of Par Arena to take the event forward. So probably Ken, you can start with a brief introduction of yourself of Par Arena, and then we will make, move on to the, to the panelist. Uh, sure, so I'm Ken, the CEO of Par Arena. Uh, we use typical camera uh, together with AI video analysis to find out what's really going on uh, in the labor intensive processes. Uh, we already have uh, deployment in five different countries and three of our customers uh, fortune uh, 500 companies. And I'm glad that we have an exciting list of uh, panel uh, speakers here. And um, let me start off with uh, Hong Tao. Uh, he's leading the uh, industry 4.0 strategy uh, in Seagate. So Hong Tao, can you uh, quickly introduce yourself? And, um, and I think a lot of our audience uh, you know, the, the industry 4.0 space is very confusing. There are lots of, you know, technologies and services. And I think they really want to know uh, from a perspective, you know, what are the, uh, some of the most successful uh, application uh, in the space? So maybe you can talk about yourself and also tell us some of the most uh, successful applications you have seen. Fair enough. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, uh, my name is uh, Hong Tao Zhu. I uh, appreciate the opportunity uh, provided here by uh, uh, Atham and the Power Arena uh, to discuss the Industrial Point uh, Hole. I joined Seagate uh, in 1996. Uh, you may or may not know uh, that Seagate is uh, Seagate Technology is one of the top uh, so-called digital storage or data storage uh, solution providers. So we uh, uh, provide uh, hard disk drive SSDs or storage systems or now we're getting to the uh, cloud uh, storage as well. So actually about 40% of the uh, world that that is uh, stored on Seagate devices. Uh, in our manufacturing process, we actually did some rough estimate. I mean, we have uh, 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 factories in uh, US, uh, Europe, and, uh, and largely in Southeast Asia and as well as in China. Uh, we generate about 40 terabytes of data every day. So, and uh, I mean, this is itself is a, I think it is a big asset or and also a huge challenge for ourselves, right? And the majority of the data have we really uh, realized their value for the decision process? I think that today's answer is obviously not. And uh, the challenge is how exactly we are going to realize this. I mean, Seagate has long been into automation since probably you know, 20, 30 years ago, we, we consider ourselves pretty advanced in the uh, so-called automation processes, right? Now the challenge is that how do we see our manufacturing facilities as well as the design and the development process into the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, I'm personally really convinced uh, Industry 4.0, the idea, the process is the way to go. Uh, that being said, I would say uh, the Industry 4.0 is still largely a journey uh, for most of us rather than the so-called endpoint. Uh, we have been engaged with industry point since last decade. Obviously it's like uh, everybody else, we're learning through our own success and the failure cases, uh, which there are many of them. So since uh, Ken is asking for some uh, success case, I really don't want to sell this, but, but uh, I think it is just one of the many uh, so-called local application success, which we uh, seeing the benefits, right? So for example, uh, we used to have this so-called very manual uh, visual inspection process. We have many operators looking at the microscope, uh, probably 40, 30, uh, or 50 of them, right? At a, at, a, at, a, at a group of stations, they inspect the parts one by one with their eyes. Now we, we adopt, uh, for example, 
uh, uh, the camera image processing and basically make those uh, so-called unstructured data and into big data space. And we use the uh, 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 so-called, uh, you know, in the data lake or data space, we uh, do this so-called big data analytics and, uh, with the image recognition uh, systems. And uh, we basically construct the model and eventually apply so-called intelligent uh, decision process at the end point, right? You study all this uh, many, many thousands of uh, thousands or tens of thousands uh, right, uh, good or bad images uh, in the cloud space where you collect all this uh, uh, historical uh, information. And then you construct the model, really the intelligent process is set at the end point for each of the seconds when the new image come in, how do you make a quick judgment saying pass, go, pass, go, right? So uh, pass or fail. Right. So uh, obviously, I mean, it, it is significantly improve of, of our uh, productive uh, product uh, so called productivity throughput quality as well. And I actually, in this case, I would say uh, from industry 4.0 point of view, the most important things is we allow the data finally, uh, image data here in this case, finally engaged into our so called decision process. Before, when you have the labor. You, you know that they make a decision, but you really cannot record that decision process. Now with this image recognition, with the uh, uh, data uh, uh, decision systems, the data is there for you to make decision with and, and for the future reference from, right? So I would consider that is a, 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 you know, many of the uh, small examples that I wanted to share here at this moment. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, I, I think in uh, the uh, discussion that we have earlier, I think one common theme uh, among all the speakers uh, is the value of data and how it facilitate the uh, decision making process. Um, uh, next, uh, we have uh, Muku, who is the uh, GM of our uh, Indian operations uh, at Wistron. Hey, Muku, can you quickly introduce yourself a bit and tell us what are the successful applications you have seen in Industry 4.0? Um, yeah, hi, uh, my name is Mukul Mishra. I'm uh, heading the India operations for Wistron. There's a uh, electronic manufacturing here. And uh, before that, I worked in product development and semiconductor manufacturing you know, in Singapore before coming to Bangalore and India to drive this one. So this is a huge plant, what we have here for mobile manufacturing. It is close to 10 to 12,000 people, you know, and uh, we have a uh, very big uh, operation lines, you know, right, production lines. So um, what uh, my company is doing here in India, we are in, uh, through this um, digital transformation going on, you know, in our company that uh, how, how digital transformation can improve our productivity as well as, of course, we look into the cost, you know, cost of doing the business and managing the human resources, because I think the important and critical thing, you know, how many things we can auto automate, you know, so automation is one of the focus areas where we are working on the robotics, you know, right, instead of doing the manual assembly operations, how many operations we can do, of course, there is a limit that there are some cases where human intervention is needed, but but many other cases where you have the uh, robotic arms, you know, which can do the job and more accurately with a better quality. So there's automation, there's a very big push. And uh, we are thinking close to 15 to 20% of manual operations by this end of this year, we can convert it to the automation, you know, right? So we are bringing, working with the different vendors uh, and of course coming coming up with some IPs and all that, you know, related to those robotic automation. So this is one. And uh, uh, other thing we are doing, you know, from the data point of view, when you talk about this, RPA is a big drive. Robotic process automation, we call it. So there are a lot of reportings and all that when you talk about dashboard, you know, right? Like the yield report, when you talk about the ECOs and PRPO process and all that. So a lot of uh, human resources involved here, you know, right, to generate those kind of robotic you know, right. So very big push from our side, from our company looking into the RPA implementation. And that's how we reduce the uh, human intervention and of course our manpower cost. Because manpower cost is one of the biggest uh, element when you talk about the production, you know, manufacturing. Other than that, uh, we have uh, looking into the product, uh, the predictive maintenance, you know, right? A lot of uh, equipment uh, downtime, you know, this is creating a lot of problems, you know, and, and uh, uh, 
rather than looking into those unplanned downtime and all that, we are looking into predictive maintenance. So uh, based on AI and IoT, a lot of other sensors which we are putting in place so that we can have the you know, predictive maintenance implemented. So uh, this is definitely helping us, you know, and uh, different alarm system like our surface mount technology and all that. So this is one at the same time, um, uh, facilities, you know, right, when we talk about the water consumption, when we talk about the electricity consumption and gas and all those stuff, you know, so how we monitor and what is the best effective way we can do that. So a lot of uh, uh, technology coming up in that field for those uh, monitoring like uh, AC intelligent management system, smart air compressor management. So those, those things, you know, basically optimizing the cost wherever we need and that's what we need, you know, at that time, how we control. So this is something which you do. And uh, at the same time, from IT side, all other like uh, IT room, server, maintenance, those monitoring system in the server room and all that. And uh, and uh, they are looking into that power room monitoring system also at the same time. So uh, there's a big push coming up. I think the, the biggest thing what I learned and what I observed that... Uh, um, cost is one thing that is for sure, but at the same time, the accuracy of like reporting, you know, right, and the quality of the product. So there's significant improvement in the quality of product when we go for the automation. Um, suppose we are gaining graining close to four to five percent of the yield, you know, just because of those issues related to the manual assembly and all that. So these are the very big benefits, you know, from the cost perspective, better quality and reliability perspective, as well as uh, how fast we can act on the problem and predict it, you know. So. These are the few things is a huge push, you know, everywhere, you know, and uh, this is the way to go. And uh, what I think that in coming three to four years, it will become a norm, you know, right. But uh, the challenges when you talk about challenges we are facing in the managing those, getting those, this is a current crunch is going on, you know, for example, like in city like Bangalore, this is IT hub, you know, right. So it is very difficult, you know, to retain the people, you know, right, especially on AI, IoT, because uh, it is pretty hot right now. So uh, from human resources point of view, I mean, looking into that, how we can give a better environment for the people, especially on the key talent, you know, how we do the talent mapping and what kind of thing which we can do for them, especially to keeping the right talent because they, they, they are the key to the success, you know, right? So these are the few challenges which we have. At the same time, unskilled labors, you know, how we can convert to the skilled labors and uh, how we can reduce the uh, dependency of manpower and all that, especially for the unskilled. So this is the big push everywhere which is going on and uh, significant improvement I, 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 I'm I observing, you know, from last one way, one year when we started this transformation. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so it is uh, automation, a lot of automation, uh, predictive maintenance, uh, but also have difficulties, you know, hiring the talent. Uh, hey, uh, Rajat, uh, I know that you are leading the uh, R&D in uh, radio meters. Uh, can you you know, tell us a bit about yourself uh, and also, um, you know, what are the key innovation uh, that you have seen that are successful? Yep. Uh, uh, thanks. Thanks, Ken. Uh, yes, you're right. Uh, I'm So basically, I'm driving one of the, the group called Systems Engineering in, in Radiometer uh, for one of the business unit called Immunoassay. And as a company, Radiometer focuses on point of care devices. So it's a medical device. And... Uh, Basically, what we tackle as a problem is when patients go to the hospital or patient care centers in an emergency with a heart attack or kidney infections or sepsis, uh, we need to get results fast. And we those devices that do the diagnostics are produced by us at point of care. Uh, these decisions that are made based on these results are life uh, dependent. So, so life is basically dependent on that. And uh, incorrect measurements, so accuracy, like Mukul pointed out, is super important. The turnaround time is super important. The uptime of these devices are super important. So uh, my role in the company is basically to focus on designing for that, designing for the holistic ecosystem and not. So I think R&D's role has changed in my opinion over the years. And that's what I'm seeing. And that's why I represent systems engineering because you have to have a holistic view on the value chain and R&D has to start playing that role, not just in the innovation of the products, but also understanding how the product is uh, installed, shipped, integrated. So integration has become more and more critical. And R&D has to understand how these products are designed for that. 
uh, digitalization value chain, right? Uh, how they are manufactured, uh, how they are produced by different suppliers. And these products are fairly complex because parts are supplied from all over the world. So there are 1500 parts, electronic parts and moving parts. So how do you maintain them over a the period of time? So uh, pointing out to success, uh, I think, like I said, I work with diagnostics right now. So diagnostics uptime is very important. What happens when a patient goes to the hospital and the device is not running, right? So that's where you can say a couple of combination technologies like cloud computing, big data, uh, integrations with IoT devices and even uh, other devices and platforms allows us to have, uh, like what Mukul pointed out, is predictable maintenance. So we know when to replace parts so the device doesn't go down. It also helps us to maintain the inventories with the right consumable supplies because uh, the hospital doesn't want to make those decisions. So, so my focus is more uh, how to enable the decision making, which is data driven, and if possible, automate that. Because the more decisions you offer your customers, the more complex their life is. And our, our users are basically healthcare professionals. They should not be sitting and making decisions for how much consumable I should buy to keep the device running. They should focus on what results I need with the test and how can I treat the patient. So I think decision automation is something that we have to focus more and more. For me, that's the theme for Industry 4.0, that how do we automate processes, decision support system, and eventually the decision itself. We can, we can eliminate that uh, manual in intervention there. That would be an amazing design. Uh, so that's, that's where I stand. I see. Uh, yeah, it's very interesting that you are applying the concept not just on the manufacturing process itself, but actually at the end, at the, at the end product. You know, in terms of predictive maintenance, which is you know you want uh, hundred percent uptime uh, in your product as well. Uh, so next, uh, we have people uh, coming from the consulting space. Uh, hi, Jackie. Uh, I know you are the VP uh, of the Industry 4.0 Advisory. Uh, can you introduce yourself a bit and? I know that you have you must be talking to a lot of different uh, manufacturers. Can you also share the success that you have seen? All right, sure, no problem. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Jackie Tan, uh, Vice President of Industry 4.0. Uh, as part of my role, I'm also seconded to the World Economic Forum to support the global role of the Smart Industry Readiness Index initiative globally. What we see so far um, today, of course, Industry 4.0 offers significant potential However, the requirements to really implement a successful transformations go far just beyond technological change. You know, it's not just implementing solutions or technology to address you know, advanced manufacturing or automations. Very often, based on my experience, we have seen many companies reach out to us say, how can they really design a roadmap for Industry 4.0 transformation, not just you know, specifying the solution, but really a roadmap for Industry 4.0. And to address this, I think uh, what we have seen so far is really an initiative from the World Economic Forum, which is called the Smart Industry Readiness Index, or short form CV. Uh, it's essentially an assessment tool that helps companies to understand where they are today in the context of Industry 4.0, and ultimately helping them or guiding them along the way in architecting their transformation roadmap. The assessment itself is actually quite a, you know, a holistic approach. It's a two-day project with one factories and that will help them to identify you know, the biggest pain points or the you know, common pain points, and of course, room for improvement and the specifics, let's say digital levers. With this initiative, we have seen approximately 600 companies has implemented this project about, uh, let's say, working with about more than 150 consultants globally. Uh, one of the good case studies that I've seen so far is actually with uh, SM, or SME, as a semicon organization uh, based in Singapore, but headquartered in Germany. Uh, once they've completed the CV assessment, they know themselves where they are today. They know the results uh, against a different bending. They actually share this result to the suppliers. There are about 20 suppliers uh, in Singapore and about 100 globally. So they share the result with suppliers say, hey, today I'm actually on band two. I would like to move to band three, but we can't do that without you. The supply need to transform together. And that's where we start to have this you know, a common understanding, what it takes to be on that level what need to be done on that level. And then that identify the right, let's say, solutions. And of course, the underlying business potential, right? At the end of the day, you know, you can't just implement solutions without understanding the business return on investment. So very often we see companies really have a strategic approach, systematic approach for identifying the current readiness, identify the gaps, identify the right solutions, 
of course, vendors is one important aspect ultimately justifying the return on investment. So I always say, you know, using CV as a starting point to help you to guide you along the way, of course, working close with partners and vendors uh, to read subsequent implementations. Of course, you can always redo the assessment to make sure you're on the right track. So that's something I, I would be more than happy to share more. But to begin with, I think this is just a teaser for everyone to understand about what CV can do for the organizations. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, and also uh, for the uh, audience here, if you search Google for Singapore Siri, S-I-R-I, uh, you should be able to find the report. I, I think it is a great report, you know, characterizing, you know, different aspects of the industry 4.0 and, you know, trying to measure yourself against the benchmark. Uh, so finally, uh, we have another uh, panelist uh, who is running uh, another consulting company as well. Uh, uh, Stefan, uh, can you... Uh, uh, you, uh, as the owner of uh, SKS Essential and also X Siemens, can you like introduce yourself and also tell us some of the successful applications that you have seen? Hi, hello, good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Um, as you see, I'm German, but I spent the majority of my professional life in Singapore, almost more than 15 years, um, where I was with Siemens. I set up their digital hub. They are let it, then build it up. Uh, then afterwards, um, also looked at the Advanta Consulting business for Southeast Asia for a while. And uh, currently, I'm a bit on a sabbatical, um, looking what life has in store for my, for, for me besides work, um, but still looking at the the industry and what's going on and uh, doing some uh, consulting gigs here and there. So what? I think I have seen over the last four or five years is there is no shortage of solutions. That's clear. Um, and what we see is that more and more of the things come together, specifically uh, the, with the help of the digital twin, we see that the product lifecycle processes in a company, R&D, uh, production planning, servicing, and so on, grow more and more together with the actual supply chain and the operations. Uh, once it's in place and with the help of the digital twin, you can do a hell of a lot of things there. You can use your digital twin to also plan how you produce it. Once you have that, uh, these data, you can start to also plan optimizing your production. Um, and eventually, um, one of the solutions I'm really very um, excited about is you can even do virtual commissioning. So in a virtual world, you, you connect your auto virtual automation system um, with uh, the virtual robotic operating system, and they make a handshake before you ever bought one of those things physically. You set this up, and then um, once you procure it, once you install it, it's ready to go. And this, I think, is one of the good examples of how Industry 4.0 can really help to shorten uh, market introduction times and also save a lot of costs. Besides that, I think there's a lot of other things. Biggest challenge I see is really that, that companies still struggle to figure out what should they do, where should they start, and what is most inf impactful for them, given all the boundary conditions and the limitations that they actually struggle and face with. I see. Thank you. So uh, after uh, listening to all the uh, wonderful, um, uh, successful cases, maybe we can switch gear and talk about what are the challenges uh, in carrying out uh, the innovation. Uh, I think earlier, uh, Wuku talks about, you know, it's very difficult uh, to recruit te uh, talents. And Jackie also mentioned about uh, the Siri, right? That, you know, they, uh, they give you a systematic uh, roadmap on how to carry out uh, the innovation. Um, and how about uh, Hong Tao? Um, can you share a bit about, you know, the challenges that you have seen? I think you mentioned a bit before. Uh, and also how, how, how do you tackle uh, those challenges? I, I, uh, yeah, I'm really glad to hear uh, all my peers, uh, panelists that uh, uh, talk about their success case and uh, uh, some of the challenges. Well, I think actually I really feel echoing a lot of their uh, experiences here as well, right? I mean, in the uh, talent pool, in the, uh, 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 in, the, in, the, in the designing space, uh, I, I totally feel that. And also, I really wanted to echo what uh, Stefan just uh, talked about the digital twin and their implementation challenges. We are, we are actually, I'm leading uh, construction of digital twin project for uh, one of our process lines as well. 
I think that uh, uh, as, as, as mentioned uh, previously, yeah, there are many solutions, but I think again, uh, somehow I, I wanted to say, right, if, if you look at, uh, uh, I mean, I'm more or less, I, I used to be an R&D guy, now I'm the, uh, you know, spending more time into operation space. Then I, I think that if you, especially if you look at it from digital twin point of view, it's really on the two sides of that physical asset, right? So if you're in the design space, you are really uh, creating the digital asset before you have the physical asset. And on the operation space, you largely have that, uh, you know, a physical asset including processes that you are really trying to, uh, replicate those with a uh, uh, digital asset, and then you know, uh, play around with that digital asset to make best out of it. Right. So I, I think those kind of the approaches are ext extremely, extremely uh, powerful and long term. I call that sustainable because it's following the life cycle of your process, your product. Uh, I, I think that uh, you know, typically we we look at uh, the, uh, physical asset as uh, Mukuf point out about it's really the physical asset is about all this equipment, all this automation, as it really connected. I mean, I, I think that we are also challenged by this is that, for example, if you look at the, where the factory labors are at, right? Because once, as I mentioned, once you have labors, uh, once you have people looking at the camera, they don't really generate data directly. Uh, when you have people handling materials from one station to another station, they don't really generate the flow of that uh, uh, materials flows data, right? So where are the factories uh, running or in the operation that is running that not generating data, right? That is a part of the challenges you want to figure out is that why the data is not flowing smoothly from uh, uh, time space uh, point of view. And then after you have the physical asset is basically that can you grab the uh, digital asset of it? Basically that you can look at all those physical assets as part of your data providers, right? Your data source. Eventually they become data consumers as well. But those data source, when you have all the older generation of, you know, uh, PLCs, you, you may, you, or connectors, you may or may not be able to get the data out of them. And once you get the data out, how do you differentiate the data uh, into so-called decision real-time space and big data space and how connect the data together. So that's part of the so-called infrastructure IT kind of challenges uh, laying in front of us. That is actually all these things is before you're talking about I'm constructing that analytical model before uh, you can make decisions, right? And then you have to put all these things together. You say, okay, now I have this agglomerate data from time to time, I want to make sure I understand how the model is, can be constructed, evolved, and so forth. And in the end, with this model is to make decisions out of that model to uh, direct your day-to-day uh, -day, uh, operations or your design outputs, right, to validate uh, some of those things. So I think in that kind of loop, I think every step we see uh, <laughs> Uh, a lot of so-called both cultural change challenges and technical challenges, and uh, uh, but but uh, but I mean those challenges in the Chinese way was we consider that is great opportunities uh, there as uh, as well. So I think it is very exciting if we can you know punch it through and uh, step by step and create the roadmap and uh, execute those. I think we are in a much more so-called decision efficient uh, process. And in the end, I think that uh, one of the uh, gentlemen, I think was uh, uh, maybe Raja, uh, talked about the auto decision process, right? We really want to uh, so-called uh, drive out into these light auto factories. And uh, uh, that's kind of how I see uh, our challenges uh, from technical side. Anyway, that's just uh, some of my thoughts here. So, so it seems like there are challenges in both the technical side, how to collect and consolidate all those data, but also in the organizational side, how to get uh, people in different teams to, to talk together. I, I think the, the protocol you pick, right? So for example, in the real time space, when you talk about the communication, what's the purpose of communication in the, in the semiconductor versus assembly versus a fabrication space, your purpose is not always exactly the same. So everybody is looking at, uh, a solution for themselves first, right? They want to solve their problems. They don't necessarily, uh, they don't necessarily say I don't consider others, but their number one focus is to consider how I'm going to solve my problems. But from that point of view, where is the so-called global view of uh, uh, some of those uh, uh, challenges, right? So uh, that is uh, uh, a discussion we sometimes have with uh, actually our peers as well, as well. And we think 
uh, uh, especially for the MMCs, I, which I represent to a degree, is that uh, you probably want a certain level of so-called centralized strategic team to look at the global view and say, hey, you know, what was the best solutions for a uh, 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 very high level? What's the best solutions? Before you're trying to have these short-term solutions, right? Because really it's about driving the so-called ecosystem decisions rather than localized decisions. Uh, so I think that is part of the so-called cultural challenges, but as well as the management challenges. And I think that, uh, you know, many of us at our pay grades, I would say, it's our job to make sure our boss, our executives or the uh, CEOs understand this part of the vision and so that they can help us to implement some of our, you know, advanced thinking. Well, we are doing those uh, deep thinkings. Uh, we, we have to let, we have to articulate so that uh, uh, we can get uh, a peer support and as well as everybody else, including our management support as well. Thank you. Hey, Stefan, now that we are talking about digital twin, uh, so in carrying out uh, the digital twin project that you mentioned earlier, uh, what are the, uh, what are the challenges that uh, you, are, you are facing? with your customers? I think the first of the challenges is that it's not one digital twin, but actually many different ones. Um, and the structure of the data behind is different. The purpose of what you want to do with this digital aspect of a digital twin is different. And, and to have this understanding um, that there is not one size fits all um, solution across the board, making everybody happy, I think is one of those learning points that specifically early adopters have to go through to. Um, also then the realization around that, that it means a continuous flow of investments uh, behind to get there. So like um, what we heard from, from TÜV before, it's actually really a journey. Every manufacturing process, every factory is a bit different. So to look at this, to really understand which portion helps now best and how can we build step by step uh, our road towards industry 4.0 in, in, in an effective and economical way, I think is one of the biggest challenges. Um, specifically when we talk about digital twin, you need data, you need information. And very often um, companies don't have that. They don't, they cannot generate this automatically by machines, right? Um, I think what, uh, what Mukul said also, what we heard from Raja before, it, 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 it's based on that we have information, but very often they, they are not in a machine readable form. To get there to invest, it means you need to upgrade your automation layer, you need to invest in certain software on the R&D side um, to, to actually even first build this foundation. And that's not necessarily something which immediately will, will give you benefits. And that's one of the biggest obstacles, I think. Um, but if, you, if we not learn to ride the bicycle, but always just run next to it, we will not really get faster. Um, so, so this bit of learning, I think, is important. And once, once you're there, then you have also a better understanding of what kind of talent do you actually need. I feel that a lot of companies make the mistake. They think just let's hire some data scientists and then uh, give them some exciting work, some data. And um, well, and then the big surprise comes that besides data science, there's a lot of domain knowledge. There's a lot of systems know-how. There's a lot of process know-how. And if you don't understand your manufacturing process, you cannot find the, the, the spots which are most impactful. Uh, to to apply an aspect of the digital twin so that eventually you can also have then a, a positive investment story towards the board, the management, or whoever has to approve um, the funds and uh, the strengths and the patience that sometimes it takes to get there. So how do you manufacture, how do you uh, convince the manufacturer to pull it off? So on the one hand, uh, digital twin is something new uh, it's more difficult to justify the ROI. And also there's a lot of dependency, right? To do the digital two trends, maybe they need to up, up, upgrade uh, the other part of the infrastructure, right? So, yeah, exactly. So I think that, 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 that portion of what we heard earlier, to have such a roadmap is an extremely important management tool, not only for yourself, for your program, uh, but also for management, for, for the board, because without that 
that that roadmap, it's very difficult to to look at isolated individual steps and always find that each and every single one of them has a positive ROI because some of them won't very often. So so once people understand that it's part of a journey and you have to do certain things so that afterwards you can do other things which then actually give you the, the ROI, and that's something which um, the theory assessment helps a bit, but you have to go way deeper after that into the process, into the technologies that you have to really identify where do you need vertical integration of data, where you need horizontal integration of data across the supply chain and, and where you don't, where you have gaps and when you can make those gaps more transparent and then can also show what does it take to fill them with what amount of investment, with what kind of technologies and how long does it take to implement it, then I think this transparency really helps to, to convince um, decision makers that you're on the right track. And it helps you also to get clear for yourself. And um, because otherwise, I mean, if you all remember still the last ITAP that we had uh, face to face, I think it was more than two years ago, um, uh, there were halls of exhibition places full with, with stuff. So there's no shortage. You get over, totally overwhelmed. And to, to select and pick the right things for you, I think you need that base understanding, that roadmap, and that's incredibly important because otherwise um, it's a bit hit and miss, I guess. I see. Now, now that we are talking about the roadmap, uh, we got to add, uh, ask uh, Jackie then. Um, so Jackie, um, so... Uh, I think when talking to the uh, manufacturer, when you like introduce them to some very proven technology like MES or some or automation, they have clear value. Uh, it is very easier to get the idea across. But now, you know, when we are talking about you know something that is newer and less proven, so how would you con you know uh, convince the uh, manufacturer to go ahead? Sure. Uh, thanks for the question. So I think in, in a nutshell, very basically, we have to look into a uh, top-down and bottom-up approach. It has to be two-way. Uh, that's more important. So from a manufacturing perspective, uh, you're going to look into, first of all, what is the client pain point, what they're trying to achieve. To start with, just a vision, simple vision, what they want to achieve, what is the pain point. From that point, you can then start to really look into what is the existing process. Uh, you may use certain tools, simple basic tools like lean value tree mapping to start with because that will be the foundation of really designing their roadmap. And then you couple with digital solutions, right? It could be you know, as simple as MES or as advanced as uh, RPA or even uh, AI or machine learning. Now, when you look into the actual implementations, uh, you have twofold. Number one is pilot implementations and scaling up effort, right? That should justify a level of what it costs, or what it takes for pilot projects and what it takes to scale it across the factory or even across organizations. From a top-down perspective, they were just looking to, all right, if I were to invest in this, what is the return on investment? That's, that's pretty much a simple answer. From bottom-up approach, what it takes then, what is, the, what is the workforce I require? Do I have the right leadership team? Uh, do I have the right manpower? And of course, what is the downtime for the whole implementation? And then what is the benefit I get out of it? And imagine you have 20 factories, yeah, you can look into different business case per factory because every factory is different unless they have really awesome digital twin do it, which is not the case today. Well, uh, but then generally you, you have to look into really, you know, what is the ultimate uh, business benefits or the factory benefit they get out of it. Um, from that point, you then look into vendors because by just saying the business benefit to the client is not enough, you got to recommend the vendors to them, right? If you look into just a simple digital twin solutions, uh, there's multiple vendors. Uh, then how to justify which vendors to recommend. You may want to look into top three vendors, uh, the cost, the service level, level agreements, the capability and the scalability. Very often the companies look into capability, but they forget about scalability. So I do recommend you know, when you implement solutions, look into pilot phase, but of course look into how can you best scale it. And using Siri drive it, right? If I were to implement these solutions, what it takes for me, what is the data integration I've got vertically or even horizontally? Um, Last but not least, look into workforce. Uh, if you were to look into uh, as it's upgrading or transforming a factory, how ready is your workforce? Do they need to be equipped with certain skills, certain knowledge? Is it in the roadmap? Because very often we see companies deploy the most advanced technology, the most, the most let's say, basic solutions, but the workforce are simply not ready to use it. And because when they design the roadmap, 
is very much solution-centric roadmap, not a holistic roadmap. So I do rec recommend looking into process as simple as value tree mapping or advanced value tree mapping, technology, lots of technology solutions that could be deployed or potentially deployed. And finally, how ready is workforce to update these solutions and combine it that should create your business case for management presentations that covers top down and bottom up approach. I see. Uh, so Wuku, how, uh, I know that there are many things goes in, going on in restaurant and, um, and so to introduce something new, uh, which is also relatively unproven and new innovation. How do, how can people convince you if there's no, for example, there's not that many uh, use cases before, it's something new and it's less proven. How, how, how do you, uh, how, how can yeah. you get into the factory? Yeah, sure. So I just wanted to share my experience. I think very much what uh, Jackie is talking about, you know, right? That uh, when we started digital transformation, we, we have gone through this process, you know. So we look into those uh, uh, different departments like uh, quality, engineering, supply chain, and uh, production control and all that. All those department representatives, we form the core team, you know, and ask them to come out with those uh, problem statements. What are the key issues you guys are facing? So, so when we talk about this uh, digital transformation, there are a few things like uh, nice to have, maybe cosmetically looks better and all that, but sometimes some things you, you must have kind of thing to solve your problem. So we come out with a list of the, the issues and based on that, what kind of how the digitization can help like the automation or maybe RPA because accuracy of the reporting was bad. We have we found a lot of error and all that. At the same time, how, how can we reduce the manpower costs, you know, right? And of course, the ROI. Yeah, we're looking into ROI and maybe some thumb rule kind of thing in the beginning that we need uh, return on investment within one year kind of thing. It is six months, seven months, eight months, you know, with all the benefits. Like the issues in the quality team, they're talking about that um, when they have the product uh, quality issues and all that, when we do the failure analysis, how the report can be uh, published in a manner that I think we will no need to reinvent the wheel and coming out with the FA system, you know, that automatically it will give the solution, you know, why this problem is happening because we have a similar kind of database in the uh, smart FA system and all that. So it is all depend on that, that what are the problems for us? You know, you need to identify those. What are the problem statement and how digitization can help? So start with that one and then I think we'll go to this dashboard reporting, many other things which looks nice and which easily accessible and all that, that may be the second priority. And uh, so, of course, those benefits, you know, right, I think this uh, all those uh, cost benefit analysis, you know, CBA you need to do for every single thing. But uh, my suggestion to everybody, I think, look into the problems first and uh, come out with the solutions, how the transition, just for sake of doing the transformation, of course, it will not help you because there's a lot of water, uh, the investment needed for that. And if you show that uh, ROI within a year, six months, seven months, eight months, I think then easy sell, you know, to the headquarter, to our uh, executives and all that. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, Roger, I think it's not easy you know, for equipment manufacturer now going to the cloud and have all those kind of uh, AI and machine learning, right? So, so can you share us how do you overcome the difficulties in introducing new ideas into your organization? Absolutely, Ken. Uh, I think what, uh, what I hear from other panelists as well is if you look at the team, everybody's talking about data and everybody's talking about complexity. And we are trying to manage and the complexity is growing as the data is growing, because we, we think that having more correct data, more accurate data will help us make good decisions. That's what we want to do. And like I said before that uh, we are building decision support systems. We are trying to automate these decisions. Everything relies on this data, which is typically unstructured, comes from multiple vendors. They are not very well integrated. So I think there are two key challenges which comes in my mind at least. One is the mindset. And I think uh, Hong Tao was touching on that as well, the culture shift of how you design products, how you design manufacturing setups, how you do supply chain, there has to be a mindset that uh, we have to be open towards exchanging data to make better decisions. You cannot make decisions based on the silo of the data visible to you. You have to go beyond that. You have to look at the ecosystem holistically. So that's one challenge I see. Second big challenge, which is uh, 
a haunting challenge i would say uh, in late late world now nowadays is the cyber security i think uh, everything is becoming digital and cyber crimes are increasing at a rate that is not visible to every business leader unless you get very close to it uh, last year i think there were 37% of the businesses that were impacted by cyber attacks and just last year the numbers were around 20 billion dollars that were involved in one or the other management of cyber crimes and ransomwares i personally i remember the incident where two years ago i was in canada i was sleeping at 3 o'clock in the night i got a call from a manager and i was asked to turn off my computer if it is on and call my entire team to turn the computers off uh, if you look at my former job in the news you will see that we lost about 95 million us dollars in the matter of 3 weeks because uh, about 30000 pcs uh, 45 plus business systems were all shut down and we decided not to pay for the ransomware which is what a lot of big businesses can afford to do uh, but still to bring those systems back up and running uh, is a very big challenge and i think where industry 4.0 is very helpful in this case is uh, i think a lot of data is becoming based on cloud so i was reading a review where they said that the cloud based systems which are designed by amazon and microsoft and uh, they are designing systems based on cybersecurity requirements to begin with so we have to change our mindset when we design our systems they have to be safe by design and and 57% of those businesses could recover data back and continue with their integrations but there are other 43% who could not and a lot of them went bankrupt a lot of them had to stop their business just with one ransomware attack which is pretty easy these days because we have no we don't have systems which are designed for cyber security so i think sitting in r and d i'm always wondering and and uh, of, of always afraid of what can happen when we digitalize and that's a big challenge to solve uh, we are still not there yet but i think that's there is a lot of awareness and maturity which is coming into the industry as well around this subject yeah i just want to add that this is very real uh, one of our customers uh they shut down the IT system for more than 2 weeks uh, because they got a the cyber attack and so this is real real and it is you know affecting uh, a lot of uh, businesses including uh, manufacturing uh, so finally uh, let us switch gear and talk about uh, the future i want to see you know from the panelist perspective uh, how far we are in the journey are we still at the beginning are we in the middle or or, or do we see the end and you know how far we are in the uh, industry 4.0 journey and what get you uh, most excited um, we are a bit running off time so if we can restrict it into you know uh, two minutes <laughs> that would be great uh, let me start with hong tao oh okay thanks again uh, i wanted to say uh, you know you know this is very exciting stage right i think we are actually we i still believe we are at the beginning of this industry 4.0 era right and uh, i would say great great opportunities are ahead of us and uh, uh, you know recently we are talking a lot of people talk about this hard buzzwords called the metaverse right and i think that uh, the digital twins we just uh, talked about is really setting the stage all the technologies we are using uh, for so called digital twins are really setting the stage for uh, the future metaverse right the digital twin is really about uh, scenarios generation right we're creating scenarios uh, inside that virtual digital space and basically we're trying to pick the best scenario the best scenarios and implement that one into the physical space and in the metaverse the same thing it's except that we 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 don't have to drive into the so called physical space we actually extend in this virtual space with different scenarios we're trying to create economy out of it, right we just enjoy and have fun in that uh, have experience in that uh, you know different scenarios we generate so i think that the future has a lot of lot of so called uncertainties as well as a lot of great opportunities and i'm so excited uh, you know uh, from my uh, 20 27 years working in design development space and in the operation space now finally i feel like this is a job i'm really glad that i'm doing and some some people else is paying for pay, pay me for it right so uh, i think this is great uh, a time to do industry point out is requires your thinking uh, in philosophy in culture as well as in the deep technology space so i think it is a great mind challenge and uh, uh, it's really fun yeah glad that you are enjoying the challenge uh how about, how about buku 
Um, I think, um, as I told you, right, we started last year. So I think just starting that one, you know, right in the initial phase right now. But uh, uh, my strategy for my company is very clear that we will slowly go ahead and look into the cost benefit analysis. See the some proof of concept where it is working, how it is helping. Then we go for the next phase. So I divided into phase one, phase two, phase three. But uh, right now it is phase one. And uh, we are looking into the benefits what we are getting. So tracking the effectiveness of that, you know, right. And then we go to the next phase. You know, so it is a phase based based approach, you know, which I'm thinking, you know, right. Uh, rather than full blown solutions, you know, without knowing whether it will help us or not. Yeah. I see. Um, uh, Ratchet. Well, uh, I also see. I will echo everything the same uh, what Mukul said as well, and on top that. Uh, we are in the early stage, very early stages to me, because I think we are still crossing the industry 3.0, which was still process automation. And we are still automating processes still in, in silos in many industries. Uh, when we start automating decisions, that's when I will call that we are in industry 4.0. And some sectors, we have started doing that too. Uh, and it will be a long journey because the complexity of decisions will also grow as, as we grow. What I'm excited about is also saying what Hangta was saying, that I, I didn't knew that I would spend at least uh, seven, eight hours a week in the VR world uh, every week for the last three years. And, and it's amazing how, how much you can learn and do. So I think one of the challenge we see today is uh, recruitment and training and pe bringing people on board and people are switching jobs. The job market is changing quite fast for people as well. So how do you accelerate that? And how do you retain that knowledge, the tacit knowledge in the company? Because that keeps lo you keep losing that quite more often now than before. So I think VR space has created that opportunity for us now. You can capture that tacit knowledge and you can upload that knowledge much faster. Uh, there have been studies which says that people retain more than 15%, more than traditional trainings when you train yourself in VR and you have less risk exposure. You have 43% less exposure to the risk, which you would in a real life training in a factory, right? So, so you are actually accelerating your onboarding time for people and also the retention and quality of the production itself. Uh, that applies to R&D as well, and as well as production, supply chain, logistics. So I think we are, and eventually the integration and expansion to XR, which is the extended reality, with will be the thing. And, and I'm very excited, even projects in my company we're working with, and it is really, really beneficial today. And it's now, it is happening now. So I'm very excited. Thank you. Uh, Jackie, I think you are seeing a lot of different, you talk to a lot of different uh... Uh, companies, right? So, yeah. uh, so what do you see for the next five years? I mean, based on what we let's say analyze our analysis results so far, we see the biggest discussion point or pain points really connectivity, and that is as a topic, connectivity between factories, connectivity with suppliers, supply chain integrations, of course, connectivity in, the, in terms of knowledge management within the employee. Right, so th this is really what we see connectivity as a topic and very often uh, large multinational companies, or even SME are having these same issues. If you come from a short floor perspective, it will be infrastructure, whether it's my infrastructure ready, how do I actually make sure that my infrastructure is ready before I deploy the solutions. From a multinational companies, it's about supply chain. I think we did not cover that today, but I think supply chain as a topic is, is huge. Yeah? We see disruptions globally, we see disruption locally. And how is supply chain being managed today is also a huge topic. Um, and that's something that I think we can share more about that in the, in the near future. Uh, the third thing that I really look into is really data. Companies always claim they have data, right? It's, it's a given they have data, whether it's physical or digital data is given. They will have data. How do they best make use of the data they have got today? Using solutions, using intelligence platforms, or how do they drive data-driven decision-making? ultimately decentralized decision making that leads to RPA and whatnot. So these are a few things that we have seen. Uh, and very often I always say that you know, it comes from you know, people. Yeah? People drive the right culture, people drive the right transformations, and people drive what is needed for the business and ultimately for the business benefits. So I really look into, you know, recommend, you know, look into how leadership drive transformations. Uh, Muku mentioned a very good phase just now, you know, three phases of transformation, I think is very realistic. Uh, Hong Tao talk about you know how you know the different solutions could be you know gelled together to really drive the next step of CGET technology that is great. Stefan talked a lot about you know the digital twins uh, approach. I think that's useful, especially for logistics. And Raja comes from an angle of you know cybersecurity, which is again linked to connectivity. So I really recommend you know these are a few aspects that I've seen uh, 
so far. There could be more because every industry has different pain points, right? A semi-core industry will be different to a FMB industry. So that is you know, another discussion we could have in the future. But for now, what I've seen so far is really semi-core is leading the way for digital transformation or industry 4.0. So if you look into the insights report that we published recently, you will see that um, semiconductor industry is really the front leading of, of industry 4.0 transformations. Thanks. Okay. And uh, Stefan? Well, I think if I look five years into the future, um, I believe that many companies have made great progress. Some have failed. Um, we will see a bit more of consolidation on the supplier side for certain areas because it's really about scaling up, uh, global scaling in many areas that's going on. While on the other side, we still have this constant flow of innovation of new companies, startups coming up with something new. So I think it's an extremely exciting time. It's a time where everybody in this industry can learn hell of a lot on a daily basis. Um, it's certainly not a boring time, and I think it's the place to be. I see. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think we only have time for one question, and I think one of the question is uh, one of the. Uh, I think we touched on this before. Like, what would be the number one pain point uh, in implementing uh, Industry 4.0 solution? I, I think there are many aspects of it. Uh, we touched on. Uh, on the technology side, uh, we touch on the, uh, the culture or organizational side. And also I think uh, on the side of, uh, you know, bringing um, or finding uh, the right people, uh, uh, the right talents to do it. So I think other than these uh, three points, uh, is there something that uh, other panelists would like to add on? Uh, I'll add on one, uh, really uh, return investment. Yeah? We look into, you know, what is the return investment? Very, very often this is, you know, beyond workforce, you know, what is the return investment for every solution that are going to employ? Yeah, yeah and I, I think we also touched on uh, that it is very difficult to justify uh, the ROI, especially for the new stuff. And I think uh, Stefan also mentioned about, you know, it's very important to having a roadmap. Uh, so I think it's, it's not only about the new stuff, it's in general, if you cannot explain what problem it solves, if you cannot explain what it makes you cheaper, faster, or more flexible, it's obviously nothing that you need. It's as simple as that. And I think everybody who is active in those program uh, projects can always boil it down to those very fundamental things. Which problems do we solve? Which people do we get off their monotonous, boring work? Where can we get cheaper, faster, better, and more flexible? And if we have answers for this, and every startup who has answers for this, I think we'll have a, have a business and we'll have a case, and there will be progress. Yeah. And finally, I just want to add on one point uh, in terms of the people side. I, 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 uh, so my previous startups were doing some uh, mobile app uh, development. Uh, so when we talked, uh, that's 15 years ago. So when we first talked to uh, some of the newspaper that, you know, they are still, you know, the majority of their money is still coming from the physical uh, newspaper. And then when we start helping them to build their e-commerce or their new site, uh, it is actually the print people uh, who is doing that. And, uh, and then they're basically doing two jobs. And, and, they, and that's why their uh, digital is moving very slowly, but it is, you know, they have to wait until, you know, um, that they really see the benefit over there, uh, that they get serious about it, and then they hire the digital team, and that's how things can uh, move faster. Um, I just want to say thank you uh, for the panelists here. The things that I learned uh, is, you know, that, um, that I, and I think it is also a common theme uh, in the discussion is, you know, it's very important. The, data, the importance of data, uh, collecting, integrating, creating value of the data, and you know, digital twin uh, is uh, one of the examples. And also having a roadmap uh, on your industry 4.0 uh, journey. And you, know, you can also learn more about those, I think, uh, from the uh, Siri uh, uh, index uh, uh, coming from uh, uh, Jackie and uh, the Singapore government. 
so thank you everyone. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, you, you will enjoy our conversation. Fantastic. Thank you to the panelists. And let's keep playing you. you now and then. Take care. Take care. Bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good chat. Thank you. Thank you.